Thanks for staying up later. George Carlin is with us, and I got a feeling we might go for a couple here. So with the luxury of time, let's start at the beginning. Okay. When did the notion first hit you that you were funny? Well, um, my mother, I, I, my father wasn't around, but he was a very funny man, gifted verbally. He was a public speaker and an ad salesman. My mother told me a lot about that. And she was very gifted verbally. She could come home from a bus ride and do seven characters on the bus and tell you a terrific story with a punchline. So, so there's some genetic thing there, and, and, and I, uh, you pick it up. Mm -hmm. But when she would, uh, she taught me how to imitate Mae West. I had never seen her, of course. This is the early 1940s. But she taught me how to say, come up and see me sometime. Yeah. And I would, you know, I'd do it for company. And, and there was Johnny the Philip Morris midget, who was a, an advertising symbol then. Call for right. Philip Morris. Well, between those two things, that was quite an act. And I noticed that people gave me their attention and their approval. And I think I needed that. Were you a class clown? One of your albums oh, was yeah. entitled Class Clown. Yeah, there have been a lot of us. I suspect you were in that category. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because, you know, um, the work was fairly easy. I didn't, I didn't have a lot of trouble with the schoolwork, and, and I was a bit bored, and I'd look around, and I'd be making noises or faces or smart remarks, you know, when, when an open question would hang in the air. And so, sure, I, I got my approval. That was it, my attention and approval. And, and I didn't have a lot of it at home because with my father, nowhere. I mean, my mother had to leave him. It didn't work a lot very well, I guess. So she had to work, and she wasn't there. So here I was, you know, with the radio and in, in need of people saying, good fellow. And that's what it is, really, when you get what you're getting back. You know, when you mentioned the radio, I think you said somewhere in, in an interview some years ago that you were raised by your mom. Mm -hmm. by your friends uh, in the streets of New York, yeah. and also in a very real sense raised by the radio. Yeah, I found out something uh, only a few years ago that uh, there were, besides the adventure shows and besides the, uh, the comedy shows, which I loved, there were shows like Fibber McGee, which was comedy, Fibber McGee, Date with Judy, Corliss Archer, shows that were what you'd call situation comedies on radio. And they had these families and these small towns and the sense of family and community. And I didn't realize until I was an adult and I was actually doing some therapy that that was my sort of extended imaginary family. That's what I belonged to. I found when I was in my 20s driving through small towns in the Midwest, I found a feeling I couldn't explain to myself of being very at home. And here's a kid from, from Harlem. Uh, you know, city-fied and loves the city in all its ways. And here I was in Decatur, Illinois, and feeling, God, there's something happening here. And that's what it was. That radio was a way for me to, to have some people to hold on to. There was always the, the voice inflection of a broadcaster yeah. running through your routines, whether it was yeah. the early George Carlin that people got to know on Merv Griffin and The Tonight Show, right. the straight George Carlin, whether it was uh, yeah. what was commonly called the hippie George Carlin, that broadcaster's voice, that ability to switch into that, that sort of unreal inflection. Yes, that unctuous thing where we yeah. say, you know, I'm not really being sincere, but this is the way I view sincerity. Uh -huh. Or the disc jockey with the big sounds, the big charts, and the big tunes. That, that sort of uh, put-on voice, yeah. I, I, uh, you know, I, I was a disc jockey. I was a formula jock on a, on a top 40 station when they first were starting in 56. That's when I began in radio, and rock and roll was just starting, so the two things were, were kind of coming of age together, and I was in on the ground floor. I was in Louisiana at a number one station in the market in Shreveport, and uh, it was a little looser than some of the stuff got later. You know how tight the formats mm -hmm. got. It was a little looser than that, but I, uh, I had to, I talked to you when I w showed up in Louisiana, I still had my New York accent. I still have some tapes that I would talk to my mother, and I would say, Ma, look at my haircut. She says, where'd you get that haircut? I said, look, Ma, this is the haircut I got. Do you like this? And I, I guess I, I, I consciously tried to lose that. So it became easy to imitate an exaggerated version of the non-regional voice. And that, of course, is where wonderful wino came from, the big sound of the big town. The big sounds of the big tunes, the big sound. Yeah, Willie West, wonderful wino. I, and, uh, you know, I was, later on, that station went highly formula. Time, temperature, and mention the artist and get into the next record. So I had about three or four months of trying to act like one of those sort of mindless jocks. Yeah, wino time, bing bong, and it was always the same time. Five minutes past the big hour, seven That's o'clock. Right. But it was the same time throughout yeah, the whole bit. I, and all of the jingles with uh, wonderful wino.
Hi there, kids. Welcome to the Willie West Show here on <laughs> Wonderful Wino Radio. <laughs> Wonderful Wino. In the days of the straight George yeah. Carlin uh, of the mid to late 60s, yes. you weren't that sort of comedian that you generally saw on the Ed Sullivan show. Even though you were yeah, wearing a suit right. and your hair was combed back and looked like it had some vitalis on it, <laughs> that's right. there was still a cutting edge to mm -hmm. some of that material. And there was a certain kind of intelligence to it that, that appealed to people beyond what you yourself looked yeah. like, if that makes any sense. That's right. I, I'm, I'm flattered and, and impressed by the kind of, uh, of insight that that you're bringing to it because you know here we are talking about me and everything and that it makes me feel good that someone uh, notices that that well you know to 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 speak of it in this in this setting and everything uh yeah uh, you see i was sort of in hiding during that period i had come out of coffee houses a few years earlier and coffee houses were very liberal and left-leaning let's again to to use simpler labels uh, folk audiences allowed you to experiment and do things that you wouldn't get away with in nightclubs. Uh, you could die in front of them and work things out, which I did in Greenwich Village. So uh, when, I, when I was in that period of Sullivan and, and those uh, late 60s, see, my dream was to be like a Danny Kaye or a Bob Hope or a uh, Red Skelton, to be in the movies and be funny. And I thought, I see, I was on automatic pilot. I thought, well, I've done the radio. That was, that was phase one. This is 11 years old, I decided. Phase one is radio. Phase two is stand-up. Then they got to let me in the movies. Phase three. Well, there I was in the middle of being Mr. Stand-up, and I thought, well, got to get ready for phase three. And in order to get into sitcoms or movies and be this kind of comic actor that I wanted to be, I figured, and I never said this consciously to myself, but somehow I said to myself, I've got to play their game. I've got to be one of their guys. I've got to go along to get along. So I, I did a, a sort of, I think, of a superficial comedy. Uh, I think it was good, and I think it made some good points along the way, but compared to what I was sort of feeling in here, it was a bit skimming on the surface. And that, that's that period that you, you, you talk about. And it's true, because I would get very subversive occasionally. I mean, Al Sleet, the hippy-dippy weatherman, right. was certainly not a wine drinker. We all know that, yeah. and, and long before marijuana was was tolerated to the level it was, say in the in the um, early 70s or whatever, uh, he was you know going, hey, what's happening? We got a Mexican high and a Canadian low. The material, though, you were able to walk a fine line where maybe you weren't unleashing everything you yeah. were feeling inside, mm -hmm. but the material itself, what you were able to use on network television didn't basically compromise who you were. Right. It might have only been the tip of the iceberg, that's right. but it wasn't, it didn't lack integrity. That's, that, that's, that's correct, and I'm, I, again, I want to say that I'm complimented to have you say that. There was one thing I'm really proud of that I said on the Ed Sullivan Show, and I was given a choice between two jokes. Uh, I had two jokes in this particular stand-up. A stand-up is usually an amalgam of things you stick together. I mean, I had finished my themes, like Wonderful Wino yeah. in the News and Sports, and I, I was putting together one, and, and they told me after dress rehearsal I could do either of these two jokes, but not both. One of them concerned George Wallace running for uh, president, and, and he had said, he had constantly referred to pointy-headed intellectuals. These pointy-headed intellectuals are going to tell you how to live your life. Well, I said, well, I said, hey, pointy, he keeps talking about pointy heads. Has he ever taken a look at those sheets down there? Which was joke A. Joke B was about about Muhammad Ali, who had been denied his heavyweight title because he wouldn't kill people. And I said, the irony is that here's a guy, he, he wants, he, his job is beating people up. And they said, look, we'd like you to go kill some people. He says, I don't want to kill people. He says, well, if you won't kill them, we won't let you beat them up. <laughs> they gave me the choice of the two, and I said, well, let me keep the Ali joke. It's deeper. It's the better joke. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and a better joke. So, uh, so that was at least, you know, I was proud that at least I was getting little things through like that. And that was early 70s. That was after, uh, I, that was among my last two Sullivans. I did 11 of them. That was toward the end. I'd say 71 even, maybe. I had my beard by then. What do you recall about the moment when you came out of the closet, so to speak, yeah. when you revealed where your true soul was on stage? Well, it was a process of two years' time. Uh, I, when I got fired in Las Vegas for saying uh, shit in a routine about that word, it was self-referential, um, 
it was the, the, the straw that, that allowed me to go uh, and, and uh, go for the college audiences and the coffee house audiences again, which I had been yearning for in a way. So um, the process took two years. I began to, to, to be more true to myself in, my, in my, my material. I let my hair grow. I let my beard grow. And I realized in the, in the beginning of that process that I was entertaining the wrong people. I was entertaining the mothers and fathers of the people I really had sympathy for, which was the youth culture of the time. Most of the changes in that period were centered around the youth culture, counterculture, whatever term is good. And uh, it, it was just a thing that, that uh, I had to return to the guy underneath the suit and the tie and, and become Mr. A again instead of Mr. B. Were there times, though, during that transition where you still found yourself... Uh playing someplace in Atlantic City or the Copa or someplace in Vegas and you had one foot in the water and one foot out? Well, the Copa in particular in 1969, I think at the end of 69, I'm not really sure, it could have been 70. And I had already made the decision in my heart, but I, I still wasn't there to, to go and do what was right for me. And I asked publicly on the microphone every night in that club to be fired. I said, I don't belong in these places. These places went out of style 20 years ago. If you see Cesar Romero dancing past you here a little later, please tell him this place is closed. But you got to give him his due as the Joker. Yes, okay, <laughs> sure. But uh, that was a hard time for me, and, I, and I, there I was. Just, everybody from GAC, that was my agency, they were uh, comparable to William Morris at the time. Everybody from that office came over to watch this happening, and Jules Podell would bang his ring on the table, which was his custom. And I just asked and asked and asked to be fired. And the second to last night, they slowly turned the light down and turned the volume down on the microphone. It was a wonderfully dramatic thing. And I, the feeling I had was what Martin Luther King said, free at last. I, I didn't know the quote at the time. I probably used it. Free at last. I mean, uh, I was then able to go and make the break final and complete for myself. Carlin, we're talking about no matter what point in time, the common thread as I see it mm -hmm. is this intense eye for the language, this mm -hmm. acute feel for the language, uh, the ability to mimic and exaggerate speech patterns, yeah. inanities. Yeah, you, you always had a bullseye sort of focus on that. You know, to be, uh, I don't want to make, take myself too seriously because I really don't down deep, but I like being serious about things that, that, that I talk about. And, and I see, you know, language is really the only thing we have when you get right down to it. Here we have these terrifically advanced brains full of ideas and reasoning and conceptual things and the only way to share with one another is through this, this system of codes that we have and and when language is abused or overused and and sort of misused it's something that i won't say it bothers me i don't lose sleep over it but it's something i like to show that i that i can correct or I, that i can perceive correctly and it has to do with not finishing school i know it does because i didn't because i quit high school after ninth grade I have this, probably this unfinished thing about me where I have to sort of prove my, my brain power to the world. So I think it comes out in this, I think the language thing is, is a manifestation of that. What did it feel like? What were the differences in the feeling you got from standing on a stage in Vegas, let's say, and going over big, yeah. big applause, big yeah. laughs, and standing on a stage at the University of Wisconsin and killing that audience a few years later? Well... The big difference was that I felt I was speaking from my gut rather than the front of my head. The Vegas stuff in those years were uh, uh, an exercise in repressing my real feelings and trying to be, you know, something a little fake. Um, the other thing was the greatest reward a person can ask for, and that's to, to be somehow uh, cheered and, and, and liked or loved or whatever words right for it for being yourself and for having something uh, inside you that, that when it got out, people were happy about it. Uh, I got my first, uh, I, I don't know, if, I guess every performer knows when they got their first standing ovation. You know, I, I really don't want to lapse here into a lot of self-congratulation, but I remember Santa Monica Civic uh, Co City College, a little amphitheater and spirit was the uh, band and Mort Saul was uh, supposed to be the headliner and he had to cancel and I was put in at the last minute and I was already into my new things but I had but nobody really knew that yet and I went out there and I thought they'd be really disappointed that Mort wasn't there and I'd have to really struggle so I just did all my stuff my, my 30 or 45 or whatever I had and they all stood up and cheered and, and that was the moment that I knew that I was answering the correct part of my body by you know, by uh, getting out and, and saying what was on my, on my gut.
in my gut. At that time, your material, material from albums like AM and FM, yeah. was getting play amidst the music on rock and roll stations. Yeah. As Steve Martin's stuff would later, yeah. as the arable Richard Pryor stuff would right. later. But it really was a rarity when you broke through in that regard. There weren't talk stations, there weren't stations that yeah. had comedy formats. In between rock and roll records, they reached your audience by saying, here's a cut from George Carlin's album. Yeah, the, the nice part of that is that I, w I came from being a DJ. The, the, the wonderful thing about records to me always was that this used to be, and even though I, I just saw my DJ days as a stepping stone, you know, a way to get somewhere else, I was a lover of music and a record collector since I was a kid and listened to DJs all the time. And um, records, all, in fact, just in order, this is, uh, the album that has just come out, they don't want to print vinyl anymore, 12-inch vinyl records, you know, nobody buys them. Yeah. But I'm getting a hundred of them printed just for me because I want one on the shelf. I don't want my shelf to go tick, 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 zook. So I'm going to have one in there. That's how much they mean to me emotionally. I grew up with records. And, and the thing you're mentioning, uh, you know, being a, a guy that the radio stations played just felt terrific. Out of a lot of trouble, the ability to be funny, the, well, it to think me... on your feet. Yeah, it, oh, of course. And, and I was, a lot of the time, when, when there would be three or four of us, we grew up next to Columbia University, and we used the entire campus, including Grant's Tomb and Riverside Church and Juilliard School of Music and Barnard and St. John the Divine, all of these institutional buildings we used as our playgrounds. And we stole things from them, too, and we created a lot of vandalism and, and havoc. But uh, when we'd be caught... There'd be two or three of us, you know, and they finally collar us. Yeah. Georgie, do the talking. You do the talking, Georgie. And you'd have to come up with a good BS story for the guard, you know, to try to get out of it. Uh, in terms of on the street itself, it was toward the end of gang-busting days for Irish kids. Uh, there wasn't... The, the, the guys a little older than us, my brother's gang, and then they got into a little more of gang-fighting stuff than we did. We, uh, we were somehow not part of that. I could tell you why in another context, but for now, you all you have to know is that. And we were more like party guys, and we were into black music, the rhythm and blues of the early 50s, not, not uh, rock and roll, but the, the, the hallway groups, I call them, the Clovers, the Drifters, and those guys, early stuff. And because we weren't, uh, you know, big fighters, uh, I, I, I didn't have to prove myself as a tough guy. And, and the way I got by was with my jokes and with my play in the dozens, being quick to slip. There were a lot of fast minds on that street corner. You had to get in there. We called them slip fights, the dozens, talking about each other's mothers, you know. Is that uh, sort of an antecedent of rapping, in a way? Well, uh, I always admired black English. I still do. I think um, there's, a, there's an aspect to black street culture. It's not just in the language. It's in the body tone. I mean, it always struck me that, 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 that blacks had the freedom, ironically enough, the least free people in our society, had the most freedom with their own bodies and their postures and their gait and, and in their music. Country music, which is a white man's soul music, country music was very, found it very kind of restricted, like this. You're just going to tap our foot and just going to sing them songs. Blacks were up there doing all of this stuff. And, and, and it just, it always was appealing to me. And, and to us kids, we drifted sort of toward a, uh, an imitation, a white sort of imitation of black street culture that made us feel cool, you know. Tomorrow night with George Carlin, we're going to try and figure out a way to make reference to the seven words you can't say on television, because I don't think you can say any of them even to this day, can you? Some of them creep through even on, broadca on uh, commercial broadcast media. Yeah. Tune in tomorrow night and see how many make it. Until then, see you later.